Hi, my name is Jeff Zeig, Dr. Zeig, and I'm the founder and the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation. This is where you find yourself right now in the boardroom of the Milton Erickson Foundation. We're in Phoenix, Arizona. And because these are difficult times, I wanted to use some of the expertise that I've collected, being a licensed therapist, a licensed psychologist here in Arizona for four decades. I wanted to make a program that could be used for consumers that might help with some of these really difficult times that we're facing right now with the virus. So the program is about dealing with anxiety. And again, I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a private practice. I am a marriage and family therapist. Also, I, I'm an author. I've written many books for professionals about how to help them with their practice. Not only that, I'm a publisher. I help other therapists to be published who have books in the behavioral sciences. I've traveled around the world and I lecture. And I've taught psychotherapy in probably 40 countries. And also I administer the Milton Erickson Foundation and organize conferences that help provide continuing education for therapists. So I have some background in this area of helping people to deal with anxiety and even depression, ha bad habits, relationship problems. Now in the program that I'm presenting for you, there are five steps. I'm trying to make things simple, but these are stylized steps doesn't mean that you have to go through these steps in the order that I'm presenting them, but these steps can be of some assistance to people and you'll pick and choose what you think would work for you. One of the components is about information. A second component, as strange as it seems, is a component of increasing tension. It's almost like taking a step backwards if you were in a race before you were going to uh, uh, jog forward. And then a step of awareness, which is like neutral. How do you center yourself in the moment? And then finding a safe place, a safe place from which you can create an action plan, something that you can do different, something that you can do that is useful, something that you can do that is adaptive in these very difficult circumstances. With the virus that's happening and the amount of stress that this is causing people, these are difficult times and we need to have some ways in which we can deal with it. First of all, about information. There is a discrimination that we can make between fear and anxiety, or fear, anxiety, and worry. Fear is biological. It's built into the system that if there's something that's threatening, our body moves into action. We have a stimulation of chemicals that help us to deal with whatever the particular problem is. We are designed to feel fear. It ensures our survival. Anxiety has the same physiological consequences. If you could measure with uh, a, a monitoring equipment, if a person is having fear or if the person is having anxiety and worry, you wouldn't be able to really tell the difference using uh, sophisticated measuring devices as we might use in a psychological laboratory. But there is a discrimination because fear is something that we create, in our, uh, is something that is biological, whereas worry and uh, anxiety with the same physiological consequences are things that we create in our mind. Mr. Fear says there's a threat. If you were a caveman, there's a saber-toothed tiger standing at the door. Mr. Anxiety says there might be a threat. Prepare right now. Is there a tiger? Is there not a tiger? If there's not a tiger, then our actions are different than if there really is a tiger. Now, there are actual benefits to anxiety. Anxiety is a motor. It's a motor that makes people come to therapy. If they didn't have anxiety, if they were blotting out anxiety with drugs, for example, they wouldn't be, uh, or alcohol, they wouldn't be motivated to come for therapy. So anxiety pushes us forward. If the situation is devoid of anxiety, there's no anxiety, well, then people don't do anything. If there's high anxiety, it can decrease performance except in an overlearned task. People break the records in Olympics when there's millions of viewers and they've overlearned a task and high anxiety is the ideal performing state for an overlearned task. Now, the goal here is that anxiety is an energy 
and it's axiomatic that the people who are most self uh, who are most successful in life no matter what their particular areas of expertise the people who are most uh, expert in life and succeed the most in life are people who are capable of managing energy they manage the tension this could be a premier athlete who at the, the uh, final moments of a game is uh, performing in an exceptional way because it's a high anxiety situation. And in that situation, when they're managing the energy is really important, and that these are when athletes excel. It's the same with people, too. In a, in a stressful situation, uh, if the stress is, is too great, it, you can underperform, but if it's an overlearned task, uh, high anxiety is helpful for accomplishing things. Now, when we're dealing with anxiety, we could say that there's two components. One component is triggers. And if we catch things when they're triggered, we have a much better chance of being able to obviate the situation to make things better. If we wait until things build up, and we're having this seizure of panic and anxiety, it's much more difficult for us to react. So we need to be aware of triggers. And I uh, am offering you triggers in five different areas. There's temporal triggers. If we find ourselves speeding up, we're moving too quickly, this is a route in which people can become anxious. If we find ourselves beaming into an unpredictable future, that can be a source of triggering uh, anxiety. The linguistic part is what if. If we're saying to yourself, what if the airplane falls out of the sky? What if I get the virus? What if, what if, what if, what if? If we say five or 10 or 25 what ifs, we can trigger an anxiety attack. What if is a uh, typical way that people create anxiety. Another linguistic way is by generalizing. I'm always frightened. I'm always anxious. If we create generalizations and we can catch ourselves so that we're not beaming into a what-if future or overly generalizing, we can abort the problems that would be created by having a full-blown anxiety attack. Another area that we can be aware of as far as triggers are concerned is perceptual. When it comes down to it, anxiety is a disorder of being hyper-realistic. If we see all of the threats that there are in the environment, even in this environment where I'm teaching right now, if we see all of the threats that exist, we can make ourselves anxious. In order to get by in the world, we have to have a kind of adaptive denial. We can't see all of the threats because if we do, then it's another route to trigger anxiety. There's also a social route. We could call it emotional contagion. Yes, there's viral contagion that exists right now, but emotional contagion is uh, a, an equally difficult problem. People uh, um, start to uh, play hot potato and they take their anxiety and they hot potato it to somebody else and then pretty soon there's a group of people who are anxious. Another route to anxiety is physiological. If you're not getting enough restful sleep, if you're overdosing yourself with caffeine products, you're lowering your insulation and you have more capacity to trigger anxiety. So uh, what I'm encouraging people to do is to catch things at the trigger point. If you can catch things at the trigger point, you can obviate a full seizure of uh, a full-blown panic. Now, the second part of this program is about increasing the tension. I, I know that sounds unusual, but um, stay with me and, and, and think about this. If you can increase the tension, you can decrease the tension. And the first thing to do is to locate where is your area of tension. Is, is it more uh, in your head? Is it more in your chest? Is it more in your abdomen? And then can you begin to give it shape and form? Can you actualize it? Imagine that it's a box or imagine that it's uh, some kind of uh, a burning object. By doing this, you are externalizing the anxiety. And when you externalize it, you have a better opportunity to see it for what it is. 
So make it into something. Locate it. Where is it in your body? Give it shape. Give it substance. Give it form. After you do that, what I'm going to encourage you to do is a tense, relax, discharge cycle. And there are are a series of steps. The steps to this tense, relax, discharge cycle is to imagine that you have a coin in your knee, uh, between your knees. Put your knees together, push your legs in tight. That tenses the biggest muscles in your body. If you are not in a public place, you can also uh, tense your arms, tense your face, hold it for a count of three, take a deep breath, and let it go. Relax. Now, what I advise is that if you are having a full-blown attack of anxiety, then the thing that you need to do is not pay attention to the triggers anymore, but pay attention to this tense, relaxed discharge cycle. Hold on to the tension, increase the tension, tense up every muscle of your body, count to three, take a deep breath, let it go, discharge it. The third step in the process is a step of awareness. And there's a sentence stem that I'd like you to repeat and think about. Once you've done the tense, relaxed discharge, awareness. Now I am aware of, that's the the sentence stem. And then I want you to think, what are you aware of as far as sound is concerned? Now I'm aware of the sound of my voice. Now I'm aware of the sound of my breathing. Now I'm aware of the sound of my breathing. Even if it's twice, what are you aware of? Then what are you aware of visually? Now I'm aware of the camera. Now I'm aware of the people who are in this room. Now I'm aware of the lights. And then what are you aware of in terms of actual physical sensations, tactile sensations? Now I'm aware that my feet are on the floor. Now I'm aware that my palms are open. Now I'm aware of my elbows uh, on the armrest of the chair. And what I'd like people to do is get out of your mind, come to your senses. It's as if when you're in a state of anxiety, you're in reverse. And if you want to get to first gear, go into neutral first. You don't have to spend a lot of time in neutral. But awareness, now I'm aware of, three auditory, three visual, three tactile things, complete sentences, and then two, 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 and then one, one, one. And if you have to repeat the process, so that you can center yourself in your immediate sensory experience, get into neutral. Next would be step four. And step four would be to find a safe place, at least mentally. Now, in your memory, in your fantasies, you can find a safe place. And once you do that, I'd like you to increase the sensory experience. What is that you hear? What is it that you see? What is it that you sense in terms of your physical sensations? You imagine yourself that you're in a cabin in the mountains, and you imagine uh, exactly what it is that you're seeing, that you're hearing, the sound of the birds, for example, and what it is that you're feeling, the warmth of the sun. Increase sensory experience of a memory or a fantasy of a safe place. Then once you do that, Allow yourself to hold that image constant, hold the, the, those sounds constant, hold those sensations constant, take a deep breath, and memorize that moment. Memorize the realization of your safe place and hold it with you because this is an ideal performing state from which you can come up with an action plan. You need to be in, a sta- in your safe place in order to think about what actions you're going to take that are going to be most useful to you. And then from the safe place, you review your action plan. What is it that you're going to do for yourself? What have you learned about dealing with this virus? What have you learned about the proper health precautions that you're to take, the proper social distancing you are to do? And then think about your action plan in regard to your family. How are you going to involve your family in this action plan? And then your associates, your colleagues, the people with whom you work with, your friends, and then others. 
we know that taking meaningful action is not just being self-absorbed, but it's a process of helping others to deal with the difficulties that they face. So your action plan can include the people who are near and dear to you, but they can also include others who you can just be a little kinder to and be a little bit more helpful. Then from this place, you make your commitment. Your commitment from your safe place is what are the actions that you are going to take? How are you going to keep your hands away from your face? How are you going to wash your hands more frequently? How are you going to do social distancing? How are you going to work from home and institutionalize your commitment? Now, this is something that you don't necessarily do mentally. It's something that you do in your body. Think about riding a bicycle. Riding a bicycle is not something that you do in your mind. Your mind can't learn how to ride a bicycle. This is a visceral learning, something that you feel in your body. Ah, I've got balance. I can move forward. I can go where it is that I want to go. So we want that commitment to be something that is a felt sense and not just uh, uh, vacant words. In summary for you, any amount of worry is too much. Worry is just agitation. You're just going over the same territory over and over again, and you're not establishing a plan of what it is that you'll, different, do, that you'll do differently. There's a phrase that I have used oftentimes working with people who have untoward anxiety. Of course, in this situation, we have something to be frightened about. There is a virus. But um, how do you get to be an angel? Well, you get to be an angel because you take things lightly. Now, in this situation, you don't have to be an angel, but you can be more angelic, especially to yourself and others. So this is Jeff Zeig, psychologist, director of the Milton Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, Arizona, hoping that I've said some things that could be helpful to you in dealing with these very difficult times. Thank you.